Christmas. So um, you can see you can see here that our next one is September 7th. And when you go to our website, you can click and go there and uh, get registered for it. Um, this email here, it's easy to remember, Wern at veteransforpeace.org. We use it for a lot of different reasons. If you can't make meeting times, if you just want to get your organization connected to us, if you want to be on our mailing list. And by the way, our mailing list now has over 1,200 people. So, um, so we can reach, we can do quite an outreach. Um, here, we always list our new webinars. Uh, this is the one we're doing right now. And as we get another one uh, organized to go, we'll put it right here and you can register. Um, if you're already doing something, you can tell us about it, send it to our email. I'll show you what we're doing about that. We're listing them. Um, any photos you have, you can upload them yourself. It would be great if you sent an email as well so we know they're there. Um, here, I want to show you these last three links here. I'm going to click on them. We we have a page that is actions and events. And up till recently, we've only had past actions. We want to have future actions so people can see it and amplify it locally or do something around it themselves similarly. So uh, most recently, the group in upstate New York wrote and said what they're about doing. And it's on September 9th. And it is uh, with reference, especially to 9-11. And they're going to two locations, and they're um, at BAE and Lockheed Martin. And you can, I won't read the text to you, but you can see they're going to do a demonstration, and they're going to, they have a letter they're going to send to the CEOs. And so they post it here for others to see and for others to um, maybe affiliate with and do on their own. If you wanted to do a 9 11 uh, action, then you might tell us that, and we can list it here. We're, hoping to be a clearinghouse of sorts for people. Um, below this is a week of actions we did uh, in uh, April. And there's something like almost 30 actions here. You can read what was done uh, at that time. We asked everybody as we could, if you can do something during that week, do something and we'll list it. Uh, so we did. Um, so that's passed and, and we hope ongoing uh, actions that we can list and help each other network to. Uh, here we have a resource page, a resource page, and you can see that we have articles, a bunch of articles. If you have a great article, if you, you know, send it to us, we'll list it. We have websites you can look at. We have most recently we put up, we started, we thought we'd put in terms of having a clearinghouse, we'd have uh, anything that looks like a tool or an example, press releases or flyers or letters. And so we already have three that we just, I just put up the other day. Uh, so if you have something that looks like that and somebody can look at it and sort of take an idea for themselves locally, that's where we'll put it as, um, you know, a resource for the for the group. And lastly, I just want to show you this new page. It's not got much on it, but we're hoping to build up with campuses. And um, so we have very little there, but as we get some campus groups who are active and engaged with us, you know, in campus actions, we'll we'll try to we'll try to make it a separate page so it's easily accessed. Okay, I think I think that's all my quick tour of our website that I wanted to show you. Um, just so you know, we're trying to we're trying to keep ourselves together, and the website is really kind of a primary place we're doing that. Uh, so now I want to introduce our webinar, and uh, as you know, I think because the reason you're here is it's a, a film. It's called Cancel the Crown Family, and um, it's a 17 minute documentary that was done by Will Griffin of the Peace Report. Some of you may know Will, or you may know the Peace Report. Great, great work that Will does with video work there. Um, and he did it in collaboration with this anti-imperialist organization called Behind Enemy Lines. So uh, we're really fortunate to have with us tonight, Michael Boyd from Behind Enemy Lines, who's gonna introduce the film and, uh, and then take Q&A afterwards. So uh, let me just give a, uh, by the way, the film is not just about the Crown family. The Crown family is the founder and the controller really of General Dynamics. And Gen General Dynamics, you probably do know, is the fifth largest war corporation in the world. Um, as we show this and as we're thinking about it, we're thinking, well, maybe this is the first in a series of webinars we do highlighting specific war corporations, the General Dynamics being our first crack at this. So. So let me introduce Michael. He's been involved in anti-imperialist struggles since organizing against the Iraq war in high school. 
He was the founding chairperson of the Chicago Committee for Human Rights in the Philippines, and he currently organizes with Behind Enemy Lines in Chicago. So Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, thank you to all the friends and comrades who are here. I'm really excited to uh, for the discussion, for the dialogue, for criticism, maybe even some debate. Um, yeah, I'll briefly say Behind Enemy Lines, we're a small uh, anti-imperialist organization based here in Chicago um, that, that grew up from some conversations during uh, COVID. And now we're very excited to have been this summer to be able to get out in the world and actually table and flyer and get things in people's hands and have conversations on the street. Um, and one of the campaigns we've launched, uh, we call Cancel Crown because we've seen that the Crown family, one of the largest philanthropic families and politically connected families here in Chicago, all of the money they use for all of that philanthropy comes from their ownership share in um, General Dynamics. Um, so I'm really grateful to the, uh, the War Industry Resistors Network for inviting us. And I'll say very briefly, when we started researching the Crown family, we felt like we were like cats with a spool of yarn <laughs> because we were like sitting there with a whiteboard and we're like, oh my, the, the Chicago Bulls, the Empire State Building, the war in Yemen, all of like just the way these people are all connected to that. Um, but what that really made clear for us is that we can articulate the, the war machine in everyday life. So we can say, if you attend this university, the family that donates to this building and this building and this building is profiting from the war in Yemen, from the devastation in Palestine, from the detention of children on the border. If you go to this museum, if you enjoy a Chicago Bulls game, all of these things have this connection. Um, so we stumbled on this campaign and have really tried to launch it as a way of making clear what's obscured, the way this country wages war all around the world. Um, so I'll just say that as a way of introduction. I'll put the links to our website and our uh, our social media in the chat. Um, and the best way to get in touch with us is to follow us on Instagram. You can also check out the website. So thanks so much. Okay, I think we're ready to watch the film. Brian, if you can cue it up. All right, just bear with me for one second. We'll get the screen shared. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, good. All right, and away we go. Let me ask you a question. If a rich family who donated $75 million to a university in the name of social work actually earned that money through the death of innocent people, namely through illegal and immoral bombings, assassinations, and drone strikes, which includes the deaths of children, would you consider this philanthropy? Well, that's exactly what the Chicago-based Crown family did last year. The Crown family is a multi-billion dollar family who is deeply connected to the imperialist wars around the world, which their wealth depends upon. The fifth largest weapons producing corporation in the world is General Dynamics, and one Crown family member is the director, James Crown. General Dynamics emerged as a modern weapons contractor during the Cold War. In 1959, Chicago industrialist Henry Crown merged his previous company, Material Service Corporation, with General Dynamics. He then became the largest shareholder in the corporation. Today, the Crown family is the 34th wealthiest family in the U.S. and owns 10% of General Dynamics. The core of their wealth and power and their ability to finance political campaigns and philanthropic efforts is the money raised by selling weapons for imperialist wars, which are overwhelmingly aimed at innocent people in some of the poorest countries in the world. So let's take a look at what the Crown family actually invests in, as well as how they direct the fifth largest weapons producer in the world. The Saudi-led war in Yemen with a coalition of nine Arab countries, all backed by the United States, United Kingdom, France, and Canada, has been raging since early 2015. Today, in the words of the World Food Program, Yemen is the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 20 million people in Yemen are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. Two-thirds of all Yemenis are hungry. Nearly half do not know when they will eat next. The rate of child malnutrition is one of the highest in the world. 
And now with COVID-19 looming, the virus is likely to spread faster, more widely, and with deadlier consequences than almost anywhere else in the world. General Dynamics is a major supplier of weapons to the Saudi-US war on Yemen with over $1.3 billion in contracts. Many of these weapons have been used in the war, but more shockingly, these weapons have been used in criminal acts of war where children have been targeted. In 2018, the organization Code Pink published a report on the role of weapons contractors in Yemen. Fragments of General Dynamics MK-84 bombs have been found at the site of many coalition airstrikes in Yemen that human rights groups have identified as causing indiscriminate and foreseeably disproportionate loss of civilian life and therefore to constitute violations of the laws of war. MK-84 bomb fragments were found at the site of a March 15, 2016 attack that killed at least 97 civilians, including 25 children. Investigators found remnants of both the GBU-31 bomb, a MK-84 bomb, mated with the JDAM satellite guidance kit, and another MK-84 with a Paveway laser guidance kit. These two bombs hit a crowded market in the village of Mastaba in northwestern Yemen. The first bomb landed directly in front of some shops and a restaurant. The second struck at the entrance to the market, where it killed the wounded people trying to escape or to help the wounded. The attack prompted Human Rights Watch to call for a thorough investigation and for a suspension of weapon sales to coalition countries. In Palestine, where the oppression of Palestinians have been going on for decades and generations, General Dynamics has been a huge influence. Since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, occupied Palestine has suffered devastating results. In the Gaza Strip, which is commonly known as the world's largest open-air prison, a blockade has been set up since 2007, preventing the movement of people, goods, and imports to the area of 141 square miles. The economic devastation from this blockade, all subject to the discretion of the Israeli occupation government and the lack of access to medicines and even clean drinking water, has caused one of the world's worst crises. General Dynamics contributes to the oppression of the Palestinian people by providing weapons to the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF. In 2007, a $65 million deal bought 3,500 bombs for the IDF from General Dynamics. In 2012, 647 million worth of General Dynamics bombs were sold to Israel. And in 2015, the U.S. State Department approved a $1.8 billion sale from General Dynamics to the IDF. A UN Commission on the 2014 Assault on Gaza reported on the devastation caused by those General Dynamics bombs. Israeli forces attacked the al Haj family's home with one of General Dynamics bombs at 2 a.m. on July 10, 2014. The bomb killed all eight members of the sleeping family, including two children and three women. The bomb appeared to be a MK-82 500-pound bomb fitted with a JDAM technology. The blast completely destroyed the al Haj home and damaged 20 neighboring homes, injuring 20 other people, including 7 women and 4 children. The home was in a residential area and was not used in any military activity. Devastating lives overseas isn't enough for General Dynamics. It has increasingly been more involved with the suffering of migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. The corporation has deployed a variety of surveillance technologies in service with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Jingoistic language and U.S. policies that separate children from their families goes back decades. It wasn't just the Trump administration with his publicly racist comments about Mexicans at the border that enforced these cruel policies towards migrants. President Obama deported so many people that he earned the nickname Deporter-in-Chief. The Obama administration also began the policy of family separation, as well as child deportations and mass deportation. Under Bill Clinton, there was bipartisan support for some kind of physical barrier between Mexico and the U.S. 
And it isn't just Mexican migrants at the border. In recent years, migration at the southern border has largely been from Central America, especially with areas which have been devastated by U.S. imperialist interventions and structural adjustment programs. In the words of Behind Enemy Lines, an anti-imperialist organization, young migrants have been separated from their families and kept in inhumane conditions, while new barriers and increased surveillance have forced many migrants into the hands of human traffickers or to cross in physically dangerous locations. Xenophobic rhetoric and policies have generated new waves of racist vigilantes who patrol parts of the southern border on their own in cooperation with ICE and the Border Patrol, and journalists have exposed that many Border Patrol agents are part of right-wing extremist Facebook groups, sharing memes and joking about dead migrants up to and including children. General Dynamics and a few of their subsidiaries have been providing U.S. Customs and Border Protection with remote video surveillance systems across 68 sites to quote, detect, track, identify, and classify migrants and refugees. One subsidiary, General Dynamics Information Technology, has received $4 billion from the U.S. Office of Refugee Resettlement, providing staffing and support to the detention of immigrant children. Now that we know how the Crown family is involved with the direction of General Dynamics and how they are so connected to the suffering of innocent people around the world and at home, let's talk about the Crown family's influence on U.S. politics. The Crown family has donated huge amounts of money to political campaigns and parties. It might be a no-brainer that they contribute to the Republican Party, so it might surprise you that they also donate huge amounts to Democratic Party campaigns as well, if not more. Again, James Crown contributed $150,000 to the Biden Action Fund to help him get elected. James also contributed another $106,000 to the Democratic National Committee. In addition, the Crown family contributed to the Republican Senate Problem Solvers Fund, but also the Problem Solver Republicans, as well as to Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn. When Obama was president, the Crown family were staunch supporters. Both the Crown family and Obama have roots in Chicago and have known each other for a long time. Obama, although remembered as the first black president of the United States, should really be remembered for continuing and expanding imperialist policies for the U.S. state and ruling classes. The intelligence community was largely expanded under Obama. He continued the war in Afghanistan in his first year in office with the surge in Afghanistan. He increased spending for the military budget, and he institutionalized the Bush-initiated War on Terror policies, as well as involving the U.S. in the wars in Libya, Yemen, and Syria. But he also amplified military drone programs around the world, which involved drone assassinations even of American families, including children. For instance, in 2011, Obama signed off on a drone strike which killed a U.S. citizen and father in Yemen. Two weeks later, a CIA drone strike killed his 16-year-old son. And then continuing the drone program under Trump, his 8-year-old daughter was killed by a Reaper drone operated by U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6. The Crown family were early supporters of Obama and that relationship dates back to 1989. The Crown family contributed $128,000 to Obama's 2004 Senate race. James and his wife, Paula Crown, served as the Illinois fundraising chairs for Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. They also contributed another $100,000 to each of Obama's inaugurations. The Obama years were especially good for General Dynamics. The corporation locked in billions of dollars of contracts with the Department of Defense and Customs and Border Protection, as well as contracts with Saudi Arabia, one of the most repressive regimes on earth, including more contracts with Israel and Egypt. On top of all this, James Crown sat on President Obama's Intelligence Advisory Board. 
the connections between wealthy families, corporations, and politicians expose the unity of the U.S. imperialist class, which depends on the destruction of poor and innocent people around the world. Now, let's quickly go over the Crown family's involvement with what some might call philanthropy. James Crown, again, who is the director of General Dynamics, but his wife Paula is an artist who has made billboards against gun violence. She also sits on the board of New York's Museum of Modern Art. The Jewish News Syndicate in the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. has named Lester Crown as one of the greatest American contributors to U.S.-Israeli relations. And James's sister-in-law, Nancy Kerrigan Crown, sits on the board of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Anti-gentrification activists have coined a term for all of this, art washing. It's the idea of using art as a cover for something much more pernicious. Philanthropy, based in the arts, helps to wash the wealth gained through human suffering under the U.S. war machine. Perhaps maybe instead of art washing, we should call the philanthropy of the crown family crown washing. In a display of generating public opinion, James Crown also sits on the board of the Aspen Institute, a major mainstream liberal funder and think tank. The Institute's stated aim is the realization of a, quote, free, just, and equitable society. I really cannot make this stuff up. The Crown family also contributed to a variety of institutions of higher learning in an attempt to crownwash their ties to innocent deaths across the planet. $10 million to Duke University in 2014, establishing and funding the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israeli Studies at Northwestern University, providing funds for the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University, and most recently contributing $75 million to the University of Chicago. These contributions are simply an illusion, a distraction that covers up the Crown family ties to the U.S. war machine and makes the institutions and the people involved in these institutions complicit with the war machine. This poses a challenge to those students, artists, and workers. Stand with the crowns or drive them out of your institutions. To sum up, the amount of wealth the Crown family has accrued is grotesque at best. Becoming one of the wealthiest families in the country, gained from the innocent lives lost around the world, all the while promoting a false consciousness of equality, peace, and social justice at home through philanthropy. The ruling class is made up of many sections, tied by a thousand threads, involving politicians, corporations, the military, media, academia, art institutions, and wealthy families, all devoted to the common interest of death, destruction, and unearned wealth, as well as the privileges that come with it. The Crown family and General Dynamics make up only a few of these threads that expose the U.S. war machine and the imperialist system. And all of it leads to us understanding that we, the working and poor people of the world, must unite in exposing these oppressive systems, immoral policies, and unjust institutions. Here in the U.S., we must break relations with the elite and instead unite in solidarity with the people at the receiving ends of the barrels of the U.S. war machine. We must expose and embarrass these families, politicians, and corporations educate the people of the U.S. on their vile actions, and create a unified program of action of resistance against the U.S. war machine and the imperialist system itself. Much of this information is based on the writings of an anti-imperialist organization behind enemy lines. Be sure to visit their website and follow them on social media. Try to get involved with them wherever and however you can. You can find more links in the description of this video. Thanks for watching the Peace Report. I be getting busy on the weekends. I be getting busy on the weekdays. Listening to people see what they say. And combine that with what we say. Cause I want them to play what we sing. And then sing what they want to relay. Cause I be sipping coffee in the morning. Cause revolution ain't no. 
okay. What a film, right? Uh, yeah, how about it? Um, I, uh, I wanna get into questions and answers and comments, but before we do, uh, we were talking about having other sessions about other war corporations, and there's one coming up tomorrow night. Uh, so I want, I'd like uh, Paul, Shannon, to tell us about that for a moment before we get into Q&A. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let's see, am I unmuted? Yeah, you're good. Good. So I just want to let everyone know that tomorrow night we're having a special program uh, in the Boston area on Raytheon and a new campaign that the Raytheon campaign in our area is forging with the uh, nuclear weapons uh, disarmament groups, uh, the, the Raytheon nuclear weapons campaign. And uh, we'll be having some speakers talking about that, including Jackie Cavasso. And uh, we're hoping to launch this new campaign focusing on Raytheon's connections to the nuclear arms race, and especially the weapons that Raytheon is now producing that are part of the um, upgrades of the nuclear weapons program in the United States, uh, focused on uh, actually being able to fight uh, nuclear wars. We will also have one of the speakers talk about a campus campaign that's been challenging recruiters from these companies, Raytheon General Dynamics, uh, at Tufts University and some of the lessons that 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 group has learned in the process of doing that. So it should be an interesting an interesting program tomorrow as we launch this new campaign. And uh, I, I put the um, uh, the link to it in the uh, the link to the event in the chat. So thank you, Ken. And uh, let's get back to this discussion. Good. Thanks so much, Paul. That's great. Uh, so the way we've done this in the past is if you will raise your hand by way of going to the reaction button down below or wherever it is on your device, and on the reaction button, it gives you this opportunity to click raise your hand. And, um, and what that does, it'll cue people up to have a comment or a question from Michael. Um, so we'll, we'll use that to get ourselves started. Who has a question or a comment for Michael? Under the reaction button, there's an opportunity to raise hand. There you go, Stephen Cabasa. So we'll get you on. Go ahead, Stephen. Yes, it's. Uh... Pronounced Cobasa, actually, but it's a common, uh, common, common error. So um, I'm in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I've been part of a uh, number of organizations here uh, that have mounted resistance at the electric boat shipyard in Groton, Connecticut, which is uh, one of the uh, corporate entities under uh, the General Dynamics. Uh, the first of these was the uh, Coalition to Stop Trident from 1960 to 2009, which um, opposed the uh, ballistic missile submarine uh, that uh, 12 of which continue to operate uh, in the oceans of the, of the world, uh, each of them capable of uh, massive uh, uh, destruction and end to the planet. And um, the, the uh, United States government is now proposing uh, a new uh, variation on the Trident to replace these older vessels, which are going out of service now. Uh, and uh, we have formed a coalition uh, of no new Tridents uh, to uh, create a network of opposition uh, to that happening. Um, it's uh, been a long, long campaign, as I know many of the campaigns that people in this circle have been involved in. Um, but the, um, uh, the need to continue to confront this is obviously um, ongoing as well. So I uh, appreciate the chance to see the 
the circle that has uh, committed to um, exposing uh, the, the crimes that uh, uh, General Dynamics is uh, so actively engaged in uh, as a model of uh, a perverse American dream. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, Stephen. And um, yeah, if we can get Michael involved, if you have a question or a direct comment to Michael, just, just uh, get him to speak to us. So Maria, do you have something like that? Uh, let's see, Maria, I don't know how to say your last name, Salsti. Um, we're going to get you unmuted here in a minute, I think. You need to unmute. You. Can you unmute? There should be a button there for you to unmute. There you go. This is, um, this is my first time participating at one of your events. I live in Oregon and Newport, Oregon, and I am active with Lincoln County Community Rights there. And my question is, big question, is what do we do about all these things? We know that there are these rich, rich families that get richer all the time through wars, by making war, and that this is the business of the United States is to make war so it can extract resources from places. What do we do about it? What can we do? That's my question. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, I mean, that's the question that this, you know, hopefully us in the hundreds and, and people in the thousands can start to take up. It would be arrogant if I said, well, here's our one, two, three. I can share the strategic perspective that we've developed in our organizing effort, which is, first of all, to manifest where the war machine exists in people's daily lives, right? Um, I, you know, I came up in the struggle against the second Iraq war, and there was a time period of, of mass resistance to that war leading up to it. And then when the war was being waged, because there were, I mean, that's back when there were newspapers still, and there were actual, you know, coffins on newspapers and the war was big news. And now if I go, if I stand on the street corner in downtown Chicago, and I say like, oh, we have an anti-war organization, people are like, the fuck are you talking about? What war, right? So it's our job to start to make this, um, clear to people, whether we're talking about, did you know that uh, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she orchestrated this coup in Honduras? Do you know what happened in Libya, where there was a stable government and now there's open air slave markets and there's in mass destruction there? Um, so the way we are trying to do that is to find the places where the, the war machine and people's everyday lives um, come together, right? So that's how we zeroed in on the Crown family and their connection to all of these everyday institutions here in Chicago. Um, and the other way we've zeroed in in our, in our social context here in Chicago is looking at the, the presence of the junior ROTC programs and the military recruiters in the public schools, where there were at least seven uh, Chicago public high schools, which in the last school year, the 2021-2022 the school year, had automatic enrollment into JROTC programs, right? where the parents weren't asked, do you want to enroll your children in this? They were asked, do you want to opt your children out in the form of permission slip given to uh, a high school freshman, you know, at the beginning of the school year during COVID. Um, so those are places where we can say like, what are the values being instilled by the JROTC program? What are the values of the military recruiters? What are the values of the Crown family? If you are a student of social work, do their values align with yours? If you're an artist at the Art Institute of Chicago, do these values align with yours? And if they don't, then you have a responsibility, right? And an obligation. Um, so I think finding the ways that the war machine intersects with people's daily lives and finding the ways to wage struggle there while we mount larger and larger um, struggles and, and I do think like where we've looked for inspiration in our organizing within the social context of the US has been the, the diaspora struggles, which have been some of the most, the militant, the leading edge of what we can have of the anti-imperialist movement. So especially and most notably the Palestinian struggle, but also, um, you know, the, the Puerto Rican organizers, the uh, Filipino organizers, um, Central American folks like that. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. Good. Um, I see. I'm going to just go down the line with the raised hands here. Carolyn Scar next. 
Let's see if we can get you in. I have a mute of myself. This has been a very excellent show. I like to be notified. What I would like to do is point out one of those things we're going to have to do something about this, the way the United States has appropriated this and is making use of the United Nations itself. The people in Haiti are being oppressed by troops which are under the auspices of the United Nations and are being trained to, these troops are being trained through the auspices of the United Nations. And the people of Haiti have every right to rule themselves. This is the first revolutionary government in this hemisphere, as people may possibly know. And nevertheless, we who think the United Nations is God's gift to humanity or something, are allowing ourselves to let this supposedly um, international um, agency be expropriated and used to. And this is not new. Bear in mind the war against North Korea was done under the auspices of the United Nations. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, you have your audio is has quite a bit of interference on it, but I. I can. I think we kind of understood what you're saying. You're talking about Haiti, Michael. Can you respond to that at all? Um, yeah, it's something that people should pay more attention to. It's something we're trying to learn more about ourselves. The both the, the degree of oppression and the mass resistance of people in Haiti. Interesting that there. I think. Okay. Thanks. I see Cynthia Paper Master next. Whoops. Sorry, Cynthia. There you okay, go. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you're good. Great. So if we want to show this film to um, to our groups locally, how do we access it? And do we need permission to, to show it? That's my only question. Thank you. I can actually answer that. It's a link online. It's the Peace Report. Uh, Will Griffin puts it out on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, the Peace Report, you can find this film. And and the recording of this session, if you want this session as well, uh, we'll send to you. Uh, I see. I see Mike. Mike Cagione. Uh, Cagione. Cagiano. Close. Sorry, Sorry Mike. <laughs> quite all right. Quite all right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm with uh, Peace Action out in the Cemetery, California. Uh, question I have is a lot of the uh, tentacles of the Crown family, like. You, somebody's niece or nephew, obviously the money came from ill-gotten gains, you might as well call it. Uh, and yet here she is on the board of a very nice uh, art history mechanism or whatever you want to call it. I find it awfully tough for some of these organizations to say, you know, your uncle really made his money bombing kids. You know, I, I don't know if we can take your money. I mean, it sounds like you're putting them in an awful tough spot. Like how, how would they parse that out? Could they say, well, uh, we'll take your money, but unfortunately, we cannot be a, uh, a, a place for platitudes making your family look good. I, I don't quite know how they would broach that topic, because I was looking at all of these tentacles that you're showing. It was very impressive. You know, I mean, Obama, any political party, both sides for the middle. Uh, and it's t it just strikes me as that you're, it's a tough one for some of these groups to say, yeah, we're not getting any money, and, and, and we have to say no to yours as well, <laughs> because, because, you know, your your hands are just too too red. How, how, how pink can it be? How somewhat washed can it be? <laughs> so I, I just love to put that in your lap. I'm sorry, but that's that's my question. Yeah, and um, I'll speak to one of the tentacles I saw in the chat, and I didn't have a chance to open the link, but somebody asked about Aspen. And it's the um, the Aspen Institute, which hosts the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is like a big, like, um, you know, bougie, like liberal sipping wine kind of thing they do. That James Crown is the, the chairman of the board of that, um, alongside people like um, Katie Couric and also Henry Louis Gates, you know, an eminent historian. Um, so um, that's one tentacle to answer that. Um, I think if we were talking about like, 
small scale donations to like small, genuine local institutions, you could say like, oh, maybe they're doing some good with this money. But we actually like, we want to put these people in a tough position. Like we don't think that war makers and war profiteers should be welcome in polite society. We think that like institutions like the Whitney, like the MoMA, like the University of Chicago um, have plenty of, of money and plenty of resources. And it actually should be through protests, through resistance, through creative actions, made a question for the people that operate those institutions and the people who attend them, that do I want to be associated with these people? Um, yeah, so I think it is a question of like, I'm trying to think of how to articulate this. You, like, all these institutions have stated values, right? Like after 2020, all of these institutions, including the museums, including the University of Chicago put out like, we stand with Black Lives Matter, you know, like we stand with George Floyd and his family. So we need to say like, if that's your true, the thing that you stand with, like, why are you associating with these people? And these people actually should be like, essentially driven out of polite society, I think. Yeah. Uh, Terry, Levi, you're next. Thank you. I'm with Conscience Canada. And what Conscience Canada has been doing is attempting to withhold taxes if they go to the military. But it's completely illegal. At the same time, people who have a lot of money give to charity so that their taxes are not as high so they don't have to pay more. It's all a money maker. Is there any way we could actually withhold legally? That's my question. I can't speak to the questions of uh, tax law, although I will mention that Canada is wrapped up in this whole story too. The General Dynamics has major, major arms in, uh, arms of General Dynamics that produce arms in Canada. And a lot of the arms sales that go to uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Israel are facilitated through the Canadian government as well. The question of tax, I can't speak to. I wonder if there, there must be someone on this webinar who is part of the War Tax Resistors League um if so you might raise your hand and we can let you say a word about withholding taxes um i see jeremy can't see your last name there very well roth kushel next thank you i hope you can hear me and i apologize for not uh having video right now i'm on mobile yes we can hear you okay great um, a very, very uh, helpful film, especially in terms of the structural and international uh, implications of both General Dynamics and the Crown family. And their role in long term in the Aspen Institute is crucial, especially when you tie it into what was pointed out in terms of information technology, GDIT, that was pointed out in the film. And that the, the maybe the invisible side of that is uh, propaganda information warfare that's heavy through uh, the Aspen Institute. I wanted to bring up uh, the two issues of deep politics and see if Mike was familiar with intersections of the Crown family and general dynamics in deep political events as uh, prescribed by Peter Dale Scott around such things as the Kennedy assassinations. Uh, general dynamics was caught in a scandal surrounding uh, Johnson around the Vietnam War and the uh, TFX F-111 fighter uh, that seemed to then immediately resolve itself uh, post uh, John Kennedy assassination. Uh, and of course, the, the film uh, so-called for truth tellers on the Kennedy assassination was produced by arch Israeli arms dealer Arnon Milchan. And then secondarily and finally, the uh, Robert Kennedy assassination took place and was pre uh, pre uh, scripted in, in many ways based on the location of the assassination in the ambassador hotel that was owned by uh, the Shine family uh, interest. That's the father-in-law of Lester Crown. And actually Lester Crown was involved then ultimately in selling it 
uh, off. This is where Mickey Cohen, the uh, Arch Meyer Lansky uh, uh, mob uh, henchman, who also was a key arms dealer for the proto-Israeli state, uh, ran his operations uh, out of. So I'm, I'm interested in whether there is a deep political aspect of Crown family and general dynamics involvement in such things as assassinating uh, the Kennedys. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's interesting stuff. I haven't researched that myself, so I'm not going to be in a position to, to comment on that. Okay, that is interesting stuff. Uh, another tentacles, more tentacles. Uh, I saw Ellen Barfield, and then you put your hand up and took it back down, Ellen. I know you're part of the War Tax Resistance League. Did you want to speak to it or or not? Okay, so we'll go on to Emily Green. Go ahead, Hi. Emily. Hi, um, I have a question for Michael and for Paul Shannon. Um, would would it be um, a not expensive thing to do to um, buy billboards on the interstate highways throughout this country? Say acknowledging in in just a few words like paul has a wonderful um t-shirt that says um uh that uh raytheon sponsors hunger in yemen i mean that's a pretty um clear simple thing to read and i you know i would think that you know we're we're all part of the choir we need to get outside the choir and what better way than on the interstate highways that so many people travel on I'm just putting that out there as, would this be a way to um, further the cause? You wanna go first, Michael? Yeah, I can say, uh, we definitely don't have billboard money. There's there's a, a donate link on our website at behind-enemy.org, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the piggy bank is a little low on that. We do, um, we do distribute a lot of stickers and buttons. Um, and you know, we work with some artists, we're working on some, um, like agitprop stuff for the return of the University of Chicago. I guess this was going to be a secret, but if you don't tell the administration, I won't tell. <laughs> but we have somebody who's um, the, so it's the Crown Family School for Social Work. And they host all of this, just like the stuff about LGBTQI, right? stuff about prison abolition, like all of this, like very progressive stuff under the name Crown Family School for Social Work. So we have an artist who's going to re-mock up the name to make it the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Israeli Defense Force School of Social Work. Um, and we think some posters with that are going to appear around campus. Um, so that's more where our budget is, is some of those uh, guerrilla tactics. But Paul, if you want to jump in as well. Well, the, the idea of billboards would be, uh, is a terrific idea. Uh, they are quite expensive. Um, another idea like that is we have often considered hiring one of those planes that uh, drag those messages behind them over a beach and all that type of stuff. Um, We've come close to doing that, but it, but it's it's expensive and the the logistics are a little bit complicated. So we we depend mainly on human billboards. We go out there quite a quite a bit with some really large um, uh, banners that we've made along busy areas uh, and and reach people reach an awful lot of people that way. But I I think it's a great idea uh, if we if we had a fund to draw on to put some of these billboards up. Of course, some of the companies since they're owned by rather large companies uh, may, may not be willing to, to do that, but you never know, sometimes, sometimes they would be. So let's keep, let's keep that idea in mind. Just one thing I'll mention is uh, on September 2nd, we're going out to uh, Bolton, Massachusetts for uh, Saudi Arabia's golf tour. And we're gonna go out there to try to inform people that uh, the money for this tour that's uh, challenging the PGA uh, and has created quite a stir in golf circles. We're gonna try to go out there and uh, and point out what Saudi Arabia is all about and thank the uh, golfers who refuse to participate in the Saudi Arabia golf tour and ask those who are now participating in it, uh, receiving huge amounts of money uh, to drop out, at least to create some controversy around that by, by focusing on an event that's gonna have an awful lot of publicity. Yeah, let me, if you haven't been watching the chat, 
there are a lot of good comments in there uh, about billboards, for example, and also a bunch of comments about tax resistance. So there are, um, if that's what you're interested in thinking about or knowing about, look at the chat. Uh, okay, so I see, is it Laurent, Laurent Gilbert? Go ahead, I need to unmute, there you yes. go. Yes, uh, is it okay to make an announcement? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, I belong to uh, Veterans for Peace and World Beyond War, uh, the Central Florida chapters. Uh, and I, I, I'm currently in Maine, so I also uh, interact with the Maine chapter. But uh, on next Monday, uh, August 29th at 3 p.m., uh, we will be hosting a webinar uh, it's entitled Back from the Brink of Nuclear War. And the presentation will be by Dr. Douglas Gransfield, who is uh, on the board of uh, Physicians and Social Responsibility. Uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, PSR Maine actively promotes Back from the Brink, a call to work together toward a world free of nuclear weapons and advocates for common sense nuclear weapons policies to secure a safer and, and more just future. So uh, I will put the link in the chat for uh, anyone who wishes to uh, register for that webinar, but it, it should prove uh, very interesting. I've heard him speak before and he does an excellent job and has a number of slides that he shows and so on. So uh, that'll be uh, on Monday, the 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're about at an hour in. Uh, we sometimes roll right past the hour for a few minutes if there are more questions or comments. Um, about anything else for Michael before we call it quits? Anybody have a question or a comment directly to Michael? All right, Michael. Michael, is it Hoey? Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. It was tell me I couldn't unmute for a second. So I, I was listening to some of what Jeremy was saying, and some of these connections are so complex, I don't know what to do with, with so much of the information that I, I get. It seems like um, there's a lot of behind the scene activity that goes on that I've never really paid attention to. And now that people are, are waking me up and, and helping me to understand how the men behind the scenes do their dirty work, I'm just scratching my head thinking, what the heck do I do with this information? I'm wondering if Michael had any advice for me. Yeah, I mean, I can take that um, two ways, I guess. The one thing is, um, you know, when we put together, started putting together the research around the Crown family, we, um, you know, we're just trying to put things in boxes. Like we, I mean, we literally did it like old school style with a whiteboard and we're like political donations, sports teams, cultural institutions, you know, all of these different kinds of things. Um, so you actually can get some of these things in um, uh, discrete things. Like the, all the information's in the video about political donations, that's actually uh, publicly available information from the FEC website. You gotta, you know, really put your detective cap on and go through, but you can get that. Um, you know, some comrades in Boston, actually the people that put together the mapping project, which is a really excellent uh, new outlet, sent us like, hey, you know, you can check the Crown Foundation's uh, public 990s on ProPublica. And so we've just started like digging into that and trying to collate that. So you can do these things in discrete ways. That's why the, the campaign materials we have, we decided to focus on like the, the Yemen war, the role in the occupation of Palestine and the detention of children at the border. Um, just for our own, like, both to present the information and for our own sanity, because then we're suddenly like, what's going on in North Africa and Turkey and the Philippines? And then it's like, we need to just to have this discreetly. I mean, my, my personal answer, and, um, you know, I go to some of these meetings sometimes and I'm like, yeah, I got involved in things in 2003, the Iraq war. But like, there was like years where I just like worked a job and, and drank beer and watched baseball games and like would go to the protests and I wasn't in anything. And I know some of you comrades are like, I have 20, 30 years of, of direct experience. Um, but it's like, read and talk to people you trust, talk to people you vibe with and, and fight. 
Yeah, right on. All right, we have one more hand raised, and it's our friend Garrett Reppenhager from uh, Veterans for Peace. Go ahead, Garrett. Hey, Michael. Awesome, uh, awesome to have you here and uh, involved in this work. I know you're from Chicago, and uh, Chicago has some of the most military recruited communities in the nation. Um, it's you know one of the most. Uh, I think uh, military recruiters are, are predators uh, in a large case uh, in so many communities, especially. Uh, um, you know, it, areas that have uh, less less income and our um, their schools uh, really require some of that uh, military money, those that federal money to keep things moving. Um, I wondered if you had any uh, any conversations about the impacts on youth and in, in recruitment in in specifically Chicago, but you could you could talk about nationally and and if how the crown family uh maybe it's it's expressed a little bit but how how it impacts academics and uh really kind of preys on getting academic uh institutions under their thumb yeah thank you for that that's a great question um yeah so i mentioned before there was the at least seven schools that had the automatic enrollment into jrotc chicago has the largest high school jrotc program in the nation um, and it's something that our uh, our mayor, Lori Lightfoot, has consistently said is a, is a point of pride for her. I mean, she's a real, this is a whole other conversation, but, um, but I think, yeah, this is the largest ROTC program. And it's something that I think is should not be a surprise that a city that has this large ROTC program also has like this like horrific epidemics of like intercommunal gun violence, right? That the one of the only funded institutions in the schools is a military violent institution that that has a, a moral dimension that flows out from that. And it also has this uh, economic dimension. We've, we talked to teachers, you know, we have teachers in the ranks of our organization and among our friends and comrades where it's like, you have schools that have been underfunded where they're not able to afford like after school coaches and not able to afford gym teachers. And then suddenly with not coming from the city, but with federal money, there are the recruiters and there are the JROTC people there to be able to teach gym, to be able to uh, coach them after school sports and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so this is a big problem. This is a big, big thread we're trying to unravel. Um, and we think eventually we need to get to the point where we're not just doing counter recruitment on an individual basis, but are mobilizing students themselves against the recruiters. Um, I think the, the other part of that question about the academic institutions is, is really important, um, not just because it's, it's grotesque that you have this money going into all of these uh, colleges and universities that proclaim progressive values, proclaim openness and tolerance and different things like that, but also it's how they, um, the war machine is propagandized for that you read an, an op-ed in the whatever your, your paper of choice is, and it's like, oh, this person's a professor of Brandeis at Northwestern at the University of Chicago. Those, I should listen to this person. These are highfalutin institutions, right? And they never tell you, like, where did that endowment come from? Um, what is the, the, the Crown Family School of Social Work? What is the Institution for Mid Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis? That sounds innocuous, and this is the people who are profiting from keeping those damn wars going that are funding that scholarship. And even if you have good people who go into that scholarship just because they're good people who want to do that work, they go through that meat grinder and they come out on the other side because they're so corrupted by that. Um, on the other hand, that connection does present an opportunity for resistance, right? Because you're in the school of social work because you want to do good in the world, because you're studying history because you want to learn some stuff about the world around you, and you maybe don't want to be affiliated with those people. So it's on us, both us as behind enemy lines, and hopefully some of you comrades too will take up this fight with us to mobilize those people whose values don't align with the war machine and drive these fuckers out of these institutions and start to make a dent in the whole imperialist system. Yeah, right on. There's a call to action. Appreciate that, Michael. Uh, I think it's about time to wrap up here. It's, it's 9.06. Um, hey, Michael, do you have any last thing you want to say? Um, yeah, thanks everybody for being here for the thoughtful questions, interventions. Um, if people have further things, um, slide into the DMs on Instagram, or you can uh, email us from our website. I'll put in the chat one more time, and that'll go to me and a couple other uh, core comrades who are part of Behind Enemy Lines. So thanks. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Michael, for being here. And uh, great film. And Behind Enemy Lines looks like a great group. Appreciate you a lot. Uh, 
Thank you all for coming. We had a, almost about 200 people here at one point. That is fabulous. And um, I will very soon send out a follow-up email to all of you who are here. In fact, anybody who registered and you'll get the recording, the link to the recording of this session. And also I'll put a link in from uh, Behind Enemy Lines uh, so you can know where that is and maybe a couple other little details too. Uh, remember, uh, if you, if you uh, wanna stay connected to War Industry Resistors Network, check out our website, send us an email. We'll have another webinar coming up soon. We have a meeting on September 7th. All this, we're trying to keep going. We're trying to stick together and see if we can build a network to, in resistance to the war industry. So, uh, so thanks, peace on you all and uh, let's keep on. <laughs>